All right, welcome to the Operators Pod. We're joined today with Taylor Holiday of CTC. This is gonna be an interesting conversation, guys. We are talking equity, cap tables, and then this is gonna be part one of a two-parter. So we brought Taylor on because we wanna talk about the state of e-commerce, do you see what's going on, what's he see? Um, he's got quite the data set for this. So as always, pay attention to the details. There's a lot of fun stuff in this episode, and I'm looking forward to part two as well. And thank you so much to our sponsors, Fulfill, North Bean, and Postscript. None of this happens without you guys. Let's jump into the pod. All right, we talked about why I use Fulfill as my ERP. So the, the number one name in ERPs is NetSuite. To use NetSuite, it costs at least $100,000 a year. Like, honestly, a, a normal NetSuite content contract is like three hundred to $500,000 per year. Plus, you have to pay a third-party consultant, and it's always breaking or whatever, right? That's because NetSuite is owned by Oracle or Salesforce or whatever. And like, it is the only way the company makes money. And it is a bloated piece of malware that has to support millions of people and millions of salaries and whatever, right? It, it's just, it's old technology from the nineties. Fulfill is modern bootstrapped ERP built for today. So e-commerce first, Shopify first, you know, that's the real, I, before they were a sponsor, I've, they've been my ERP for like four years at this point. And it's because they're the only modern option available at a reasonable price point. And they're thinking about the future, right? I mean, they haven't raised billions of dollars, right? I think they did one seed round one time. So they're a bootstrap SaaS company. The reason why that's important is I don't know if you've ever invested a lot of money into a SaaS tool just for them to go bankrupt, right? Or the news right now is that AMP just got bought by MailChimp and you have to stop using AMP. And <laughs> they just became the, the gold standard of, of, of email pop-up and now you can't use them anymore. That's what happens with VC-backed companies. Fulfill is here for the long-term. They're thinking about the long-term vision of this. And that's why I've used them for four plus years and I'm going to stick with them. Not only because it's a massive pain in the ass to change your ERP, so like I'm very incentivized to never leave, but it's because they're delivering good service at a good value with a long-term mentality. So what does that mean? They're shipping features that have the biggest impact, not features that you know, will help them land the next client that they need to be you know, profitable. They're trying to make us happy so that we invest more and stay longer into this program. Investors aren't the customers. The customers are the customers. Kind of like Ridge, our customers are our customers. So that's why I love Fulfill. That's why I'm using Fulfill. They're investing in customer support, making sure the product is usable and staying at the top of the, the e-commerce industry. If you need an ERP and you cannot afford or will not pay for NetSuite, Fulfill is my option of choice. Thank you so much. I'd say if there's anything I've learned over 10 years, it's how critical your cap table is as a life force for whatever you're trying to do. And if it ends up dispersed, it's a real problem. Well, Man, Taylor, I cap can talk table, about that. <laughs> geez, cap table is like, it's marriage level ramifications uh, in oh, terms yeah. of how it impacts your life. And people just don't realize that. Like that's probably one of the biggest things being an entrepreneur is, that you just you should think long and hard before any cap table decisions because then you you end up you know sleeping in that bed for the next 10 20 years whatever and totally. you know we've we've all heard horror stories you know that and and some of us have had the really tough conversations that come with that we should go totally. over everybody's cap table because taylor I, i'd be, I'd love, I'd be, I'd be curious do you have investors or or who who owns shares yeah no not no investors, uh, but it's just a very broad set of employee base that was three partners, two of them left. And we sort of went to them and said, Hey, you're not here anymore. We're not going to spend the rest of our, or I really said, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life building a thing that I, that 66% is passively controlled by people who aren't here. And so we bought them out at a very preferred rate and brought a bunch of the employees into it. Um, we have a 20% ESOP. We've done all sorts of whack. Uh, pardon my language, but um, it's been it's been quite a journey. But my biggest thing is like it's like a life force. You know, the cap table points energy into the organization, and if people have it and they're not inside the thing, they suck life out. 
and they they just have a very different set of interests it feels like and so i think the biggest transition for us has been getting that energy back into the organization and the uh the shares into the hands of the people doing the work <clears throat> i was writing a thing last night where i think ridge can get to a billion dollars in revenue because everyone who owns shares is an operating partner that, that's so, right like, i think i think that is the, I think that is the fundamental key is that the people yes. who own the thing do the work are in the operating. Thing. Yes. Yeah. That's the, that's probably our single biggest. Uh, one of the things I was, I was thinking about this when it came to our competitors is that it, it's inter interestingly in business, there's all these forces that when you start to do really well, then work against you and pull you back to the pack, your outperformance. So like as a simple example, if, uh, if you're a buyer, and you make some really good decisions and your category starts to really outperform, then you immediately start looking to get promoted because number one, you have the resume to get promoted, but also number two, you have really difficult comps that you're going to have to go up against year over year. The same thing happens all over the place. It happens in all kinds of businesses. If you're in the corporate world and you come in to company XYZ in CPG and you put up 40% growth one year, then there's a lot of incentive to start thinking about how do I parlay that to a job where I make more at another company than staying where I'm at? Because if I stay where I'm at, maybe I have to go up against that 40% growth comp and that's going to be really difficult. Whereas if I jump ship, I can go jump into another opportunity where there's a lot of growth teed up and where I can make more money. And so when companies go through really successful stretches, it's really easy for them to hemorrhage talent because the talent's not aligned on the equity side and doesn't really have long-term incentives. They're just trying to maximize what they get out of the contribution they've made. When you have a team where your operators all have equity, they're able to think, you know, in terms of chunks of time, five years, 10 years, 15 years, which is really different. There's also Dude. a, there's a double-edged sword to the talent thing though, Mike, because um, you see this in Silicon Valley versus the rest of the world. Like everybody culturally in the Bay Area, people understand equity at an employee level, right? So they use it as a, an attraction retention thing to get great people, but then the people know how equity works. So they kind of move around companies every two, three years, right? Just scooping up chunks of equity. And then out on the outside, so like everywhere but the Bay Area, in my experience, employees do not understand equity. There's a gross misunderstanding uh, beyond a certain level of, uh, of operator of what the hell it is and how it works and like the various types. And, and Sean, I know you've written on this and I've definitely written on this. It, in my experience, it has not proved to be a major retention mechanism. Um, and that's mostly because when I start having conversations with people, they have no clue how it works. <laughs> the key is get them to write a check. Well, that's, I, we've done yes. that too. That, that, that's what people understand. Oh, for they sure. understand. They understand their money and then it actually matters to them. But if they receive it uh, in an alternative fashion or it's an option, I agree. It's like, it, it is functionally zero in their head. Yeah. But when they, Imaginary. I think the, yeah. the, the, the biggest difference has been we had 10 employees write a check in this past year and it has been transformative to their own perception of the, the value for sure. Yeah. yeah dude, equity is usually a liability, right? It, 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 it's, either, it's either worthless or a lot of times it's a liability. Hey, you own a chunk of a business losing money. What are you going to do about it? Right? Like, like, and usually they do nothing. <laughs> so yeah, it's so rare for the equity to actually be worthwhile, but then like everyone talks about like they want it. Uh, but I don't think they're actually ready for like all the things that come with being a shareholder in a business or an operating partner in a business because it usually sucks. I'm sure we can all attest to that. Only when things are great, people are like, well, where's my piece of this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so let's compare the cap tables. Somebody mentioned this. Let's compare cap tables. Uh, start with you, Taylor. Tell us about your cap table. What does it look like? Yeah, How many so, people? All that stuff. I mean, every employee in my company is on our cap table because we have an ESOP that controls 20% of the company. That's a held in a trust that's dispersed to every employee pro rata on a percentage of their salary as a percentage of payroll. It's a tax-free benefit to them that vests over six years um, that we had to, over the course of four years since the time we did the transaction, disperse all those shares. So they are fully distributed now. So new employees won't participate. That's one set. Then I own about 40% uh, of the company. And then my, say, let's say top 12, 15 employees all own somewhere between one to five percent that makes up the the rest of the other 40 um, and that's novel and then my my the initial partners each own five percent sorry so it's five percent each for my passive partners that's 10 
ESOP 20, me 40, and then the employee share the rest. Mm. But that's and been how like do you a feel about being less than 50%? There. Taylor, you're it's, less than 50%. How does, yeah. walk us through why you're comfortable being at less than 50%. i am not. I, it's why I won't be at CTC <laughs> forever. Just candidly, like it's, it's a, it's a lesson learned through many years of partnership and the initial vision transformed to what it is today. But, um, yeah, it was, it was mistakes probably candidly by me relative to the way I treated and held the importance of equity versus partnership versus obligations within the context of those things. And, um, lots of learning, but it's not ideal for me. <clears throat> what does the board look like? Uh, it's comprised of an employee elected representative that represents the trust myself, uh, and one other, uh, one other member. So small, so we functionally have a lot of control, but, um, there is still governance external to me. Hmm. Why did you set the board up? Like what, what was, uh, we what had was the to purpose of that? Oh, you had to. Yeah. Under with the ESOP, uh, and transitioning mm -hmm. to a corporation, we were required to. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's an American because you, you, there's, yeah. Cause technically the ESOP, <laughs> Yeah, the ESOP has, a, you have an external trustee, I'm assuming, yeah. for the ESOP? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So I'll, I'll talk about ours. Ours is, uh, we've got about 16 individuals on the cap table. Um, every, all of them except for one were operators at some point in the history of the business. I think 13, out, 12 out of the 16 are still active operators. Um the we also have an ESOP. It's uh, we're doing a contributory model, which means you you add some every year. So I think this is our first year. We'll add like a percent of the company or something percent, one point two five percent, and uh, each year we'll be we'll be adding to that. Uh, like Taylor mentioned, and we mentioned on this episode before, you can do these chunk transactions where it's like, hey, we're going to put in twenty percent or something, um, and it actually is a pretty interesting vehicle for creating liquidity and exits for minority owners. Maybe we'll do that at some point. Um, we, the, the way that it worked, my, uh, when we first started the company, I had, oh, I, I think right around 50% and my co-founders each had about a quarter. Um, and my real preference, I had been in a business with my brother where my brother owned 85% and that was great, uh, financially, but I think he experienced on the kind of working governance side, some of the downsides of that. And that was the experience I was fresh off of. So I was not really concerned with having like the largest percentage. I was more really concerned with, hey, how is the work going to get done? How are decisions going to get made? We had a really atypical structure where um, I had, uh, at one point, I, I got to less than 50% of the profits interest, but we set up the operating agreement where I had 50.0% of the voting interest. And everybody's like, well, why would you do 50.0? And the idea was, that I didn't want it to be a dictatorship where I could just make decisions unchecked, but I didn't want a situation where anybody could shove anything down my throat that was kind of antithetical to what we wanted the company to be. And then as we started to grow the company, we did a couple of rounds where we kind of allowed operators to buy in and what we felt like was a really generous valuation, but they did have to buy in. They had to write checks. Um, you know, guys took out mortgages on their house. Uh, there were, there was actual sacrifice to be, to get onto the cap table, which I think ended up mattering quite a bit. Mike, what was the evaluation? Like what, what size the check are people putting in? Yeah. The first one, I think we did a 10 million valuation and the second one was 20 million. This would have been back in like 2017, 18, 19, kind of in that range. So, you know, we were doing it for like less than. It, it was an attractive valuation, I think, at the time. Like it was, you know, less than one x revenue, and we were growing really fast, and we were profitable. Um, so it was kind of like, how how low a valuation can we do where it's like defensible, but we feel like we're allowing people to get a good deal. Well, yeah. dude, let's open another round: ten, twenty, thirty million this <laughs> time. I'll, I'll jump right in. <laughs> let's go. We'll all throw well, in. Yeah. <laughs> the valuation's gone up just a hair. I'll, yeah. I'll warn you. Yeah. Um. Matt, you probably have the most complex one I, here. I'm looking at mine right now, and I'm like, we don't have enough time for this shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, we if you don't. can't explain it, if you can't explain it via audio, it's too complicated. <laughs> like, I would need a fucking whiteboard and and a, and a chart. No, uh, okay, here, I'll give you some like high level things. So we're, if you're new to the show, we are institutionally backed. So I have big investors. Um, we've raised tens of millions of dollars over six, seven years. Um, the founding partners, there's three of us. 
we still own about 58% of the business. Um, and then our employees own, I want to say like another, I feel like there's like eight and change, eight and a half, eight, 9%, somewhere in there. This is fully diluted. So like over multiple rounds. Uh, so as I guess, as founders, we still have voting control for most things. Um, like we, I mean, when you take institutional money, Taylor, like, you know, we have a, we have a board. Um, I, I like to call it, it's like my one time where I have to put on my pants and, and like be a, be a real CEO. Uh, our, sh our investors own the rest. And so like, I can't give you the exacts cause I think that's not allowed. Um, but I want to say like, we have two or three big check writers that own like of the, you know, 30, some 40% that they own call it nine, 80, 80% 80 of that is large check writers. Matt, do you have an employee pool or? We do, we have an ESOP. Um, usually, I, so the way that we set that up is that's limited to very senior people or very key people, right? We don't just hand it out to everybody. This is like, I've talked to so many people about this, especially like even my competitors in the Bay Area um, where they just hand out equity to everybody. We have had not, we've just not had a great experience with every single person really understanding it. And I just decided, I'm like, I don't want to be the person that educates everyone on how equity works and ownership works. That's not my mission in life. So no, we, every single person that's like part of our leadership team has equity. Um, so unlike a lot of companies, you do have to buy ours, right? So when it vests, you have an option to buy it and we do value the business like reasonably we don't try to make it a penny stock where you get it for like absolutely nothing and it doesn't have any like bite to it i just want people to feel equity um funny enough sean that what you're talking about with like having operating partners in the business this is something i'm struggling with right now because both of my co-founders are not super active mm -hmm. in the business right so like of all of them i own the biggest chunk i own about 20 it says 25.2% is what my, my current cap table says. Uh, that I'll give you like, so Taylor, you at 40, right? You're like, that does not feel like enough. For what I'm trying to do, I'm fine, right? Like, and I think the full context there, I've already sold a company. So like when we, when I got into this, I got into this to take a moonshot. This was like either going to the moon or literally going to zero. And I'm comfortable with both outcomes because I'm trying to do something really hard. Um, so like I, from my perspective, like the amount I own feels directionally correct for the cash we've taken in for the risk that we're all taking. And I'm just for additional context, I am a check writer in this business. I have a lot of my own money invested in this company. I didn't just like go out, take a bunch of investor money. Part of that is also, I like, I like to feel it. I like to feel like I'm also on that side of the table not just the dude doing the work. All right. I want to talk about Postscript for a minute. We switched to Postscript a few months ago and the transition was completely seamless. And I have to say like the level of commitment they have to their clients is exceptional. They chased us for a really long time. So we're using their SMS platform and it's gone off without a hiccup. Uh, like I said, they're really committed to us. Um, the pricing was very reasonable. And they are working on some really cool stuff with AI. And I think we should expect an announcement from that pretty soon. So check out Postscript if you knew an SMS. So, you know, the reason why board control is so important is because the board can issue more shares and, and it can dilute people and it can approve compensation packages that are uneven for the dilution. So what I'm yeah. trying to say is like, if you have control of the board, I mean, if Taylor does or Mike does or Matt does, and you have non-operating minority partners, you could theoretically dilute them more and be like, you don't That's like, right. and it, ha it happens, it happens all the time in public companies, right? If like, you're no longer the CEO, yeah. they're going to issue more shares to the next CEO because you're not doing the job anymore. So, yeah. So this is worth, this is worth saying yes. here that like, People do not appreciate this. If you have equity in a private company, the single most important question is, 
the person who's really going to be calling the shots, do you trust them? And what do you think about them and their character? Because yep. they have a multitude of ways that they can stack the deck, screw people, whatever. And, you know, we've all heard those stories it, kind of to your point, Sean, if you have control from a voting perspective, if you have control of the board, then you can pretty much do whatever you want to do. And I, I do think it's an interesting question uh, that when you have people that have significant chunks that are no longer operating, like, how do you handle that? Do you try to buy them out? Um, because it does get really hard. Like you're, it's supposed to be that like, okay, you compensate people with a salary for their management. And then the equity is for, con you know, whatever con contributions of, of capital that they've made or time that they've served in the past. And if you do a really good job when it comes to compensation, you can peel those two things apart. Um, but, but practically, that's very rarely how it actually works out. And so it's very easy to have situations that don't feel equitable, where you've got somebody who is continuing to work on the business and they've got, you know, 25% and they're grinding away and making maybe even, you know, like for me, my salary, I don't know what a market salary is for me. This is actually one of the things that came up. Taylor mentioned it. When you become an ESOP, you have to have a board. And I had been taking a salary, I, I guess I'll, I'll show you here. I took the first few years of the company, I took $125,000 salary, which I knew was under my market value. And then for several more years, I took $150,000 salary when other people were making more because I had way more equity and I was fine with that. But then when we, when we went to an ESOP, it's like, okay, you can't do that anymore. Like that's, you know, like that's, that's not good governance. If you were going to be replaced by CEO X, there's no way that they would take your compensation package. And so what we had to really take a look at like, okay, what's my compensation package? So one of the ways you can kind of offset this problem and Taylor, even with you, like one question I guess I'd ask you is like, why don't you have equity, additional equity built into your compensation package? Like that's one way that you could stay at CTC is if you said, look guys, for me to be here long-term, I'm going to need to get to be over mm -hmm. a 50% owner. And I feel like it's a reasonable ask that equity is part of my annual comp. Have you thought about that? How have you handled that? Yeah, totally. I, I think that what you guys are saying is exactly right in that when you have control, you have the ability to exert whatever force you're willing to do against whatever relational Bro. consequences you want to, you want to endure. Uh, and I think I, I went through a big piece of that getting 30% of the company back and distributing it amongst key leaders as well as myself. And a thing that was very relationally straining with two people who are very close to me. And sitting down and saying, this is the price I'm going to pay you, or there's not going to be a thing anymore. And um, that was those were really hard days and really hard conversations with people I have 30 years of relationship with. Um, and so it's like, I think there's so many lessons about who, to your point of the marriage metaphor, Mike, of like who you're getting into relationship with and what the kinds of conversations may arise and what kind of cost remote, emotionally and relationally you're willing to pay relative to the financial things that you want. And so that's a constant consideration and trade-off uh, all along the way. Yeah. And people do not think about this. They don't think about the fact that it's about more than money because there are lots of things you can do where you get more money out of the business. But if you nuke three or four close relationships or you have to deal with a lot of acrimonious back and forth, that that pulls down on your quality of life. Maybe the extra money pulls up, but the but the, you know, a sense that people that you've worked hard with and built something with, or that you were close with now, like, you know, dislike you or whatever, that'll pull down. And there's a lot of, there's just a lot of calculus in trying to figure out how to manage relationships and money in privately totally. held businesses. Totally. Yeah. I think Mike, like the knowing what you know today, what would you change? That question. Yeah. That's, I well, think that's probably got to be like one of the most like top 10 most powerful questions in business. You can use it with hiring and firing. You can use it with cap table you can use it with like pretty much any deal you've done right would you do that deal again today look i think um how would I you do I'm, how would you approach equity differently matt you've been through an exit you're in your current situation like you, you just told us how you're set up how would you approach the the subject of equity differently if you could go back in time in a time machine and talk to matt 20 years ago so i i that's a good question i'll give you two answers I would have raised, knowing what I know today, like if I somehow had that superpower, uh, I would have raised no money 
for Pila, like the materials business, because we raised money to go do R&D on materials, I wouldn't have done that. And I would have raised way more money for Lomi. Mm. Like way more. Cause that, and what's the rubric that decides those two things? Like why uh, not raising on one side and raising on the other side? I think Pila behaves like functionally and like the model of it behaves very much like a consumer business. So like any, like Sean or Ridge or Simple Modern or any, any consumer business and it just doesn't need capital. Like I think the margins work, the whole the business just works, right? Um, if, if there was no ambition to go beyond like these are the materials we know and work with, like the business just works. Uh, the Lomi side of the business, like I'm going up against a $2 trillion industry called waste management that are massively capital intensive. The sales cycles are insanely long. Like you're dealing with municipalities and landowners and developers and like none of these people move quickly. There is no Facebook ads of cities, right? Like I can't just turn this shit up and down as I feel. Um, so, and then the R and D cycles are crazy. Like to make a hardware, firmware, software product, the investment is just fucking bananas, um, mm -hmm. to put it bluntly. So like when I, when I, when I think about it, I would do that differently. The actual equity split, Mike, like who owns what? I think what I would do there is I would have a much more raw conversation around how long and how much is everybody willing to put from a life force into this. So like I look at everything as through seasons. It's like every season is five years. You know, I sort of signed up for this thing and I'm going to be in it for probably two seasons, 10 years. Um, and that was coming off of selling my last company. So I was kind of in a spot where I'm like, I could do nothing or which that just didn't sound like that was going to last very long. Uh, or I could do something that felt meaningful, right? But with partners, and I would probably sit down and have that conversation, like how long and how much of your life are you willing to invest in this? And then what are you gonna do, right? And we, Mike uh, or Taylor, similar to you, when we initially raised investment capital, this is back in 2018, I think was the first outside money we took in, beyond like Brad and I uh, putting cash in, we actually ended up buying out a significant chunk of Jeremy's uh, ownership in the business. And that was simply because like everything was upside down and, and the outside investors actually looked at it and said like, Matt, you don't own enough. Mm -hmm. So like we need to right size this. And the way to do that is to secondary out some amount of his shares, right? So I ended up actually writing even more money at that point out of my own pocket to buy out part of Jeremy, so did Brad, so did our, our shareholders. Matt, how, how many dollars are you committed in right now? Like not even years in this business or effort or whatever. How many dollars are you in? I don't know. I, like it's gotta be. Is it a million Canadian? Oh yeah. Is it 2 million Canadian? No. Okay. So <laughs> It's a lot. Like so it, it, it feels like a lot. Let me put it that way, right? Like totally. I, don't, I don't own a single thing. And uh, that's actually not true. I do own single things that are more than this company at this point, yeah, but that's because they've appreciated in value. Um, no, but like my, and so, so like in, in fairness, right. My co-founder, Brad, like he's also got a lot of money in this business. Um, mine came like, cause I was, I was the original check writer in this company. So like I started, I put, you know, I think a quarter million or more into the business before it had a dollar of revenue. So like when we were still screwing around with materials, trying to figure out what to make and how to make it. And, and even beyond that, like how, who the hell's going to buy this thing? Mm -hmm. You know, like when we launched Pila Case, the world is full of phone cases. It's like the most competitive market out there. Sean, you know this now. And every single one of them, the, the pitch is simple. It's like, we're the most protective. And then we showed up and said like, we're going to sell one that disintegrates. Like nobody thought that was a good idea. <laughs> right? So we... Like when I was putting money in that business at that time, my wife is like, what the fuck are you doing? Um, mm -hmm. I just thought the story was cool. So yeah. And look, I, I don't think I would change any of that. Like I'm happy to have money in the business. I actually find it gives me like a really, a strong set of additional incentives to do my damn best. 
What's up everybody, welcome to the Operator's North Beam Ad Unit. So 30 seconds, I'm gonna tell you all about how if you have any problems with North Beam, you can directly message Austin, the CEO. He is there, he will set up your ad account, he will make your bed, he'll give you cookies. Really, they have a dedicated team of people, probably 30, 40, 50 reps at this point, who will make sure North Beam is working correctly and functioning so you can get amazing data out of this ecosystem. They will be more hands-on than any meta rep will ever be, and they're gonna help you understand where your ad dollars are best spent, best positioned, and which ads are working. My team works with the North Beam team literally every day. They're in my Slack. Maybe you don't get the same level of uh, support as an operator, but they will be there to make sure it's working. And if you're not happy at all, just email Austin. He will take care of you. We use North Beam every day. It's a benchmarking tool. It's super helpful for forecasting, daily pacing, inter-hour pacing. So we can see like if we just launched an ad in two hours, if it's working or not, that's what North Beam does for us. So thank you, North Beam, for the support. I'm customer probably number one. So thank you so much. Well, one thing to add regarding North Beam, because we just went through a contract renewal with them on their, uh, specifically on the MMM. And uh, we got a pretty sweetheart deal and I expect them to come back to us and raise our price and they kind of deserve it. it I, I was like, let me, let me reach out to the team, you know, and see how it's going. Right. Cause I'm not in the day to day that I get, I get feedback. And the team was like, they have improved the MMM so much since we started it that they were like, we should definitely pay for this increase. So, and my team hates every agency and most SaaS. The, the only person that hates SaaS, uh, the only more than my team is Sean, Frank. Um, but yeah, I mean, they came to us. They're like, hey, you guys got the, the sweetheart deal. We wanted the first MMM clients. And I, I was very, very pleased when my team was like, it's really working well for us. So that's my little MMM plug. Equity can lead to really hard feelings. It can lead to really hard questions and hard conversations. Uh, what are, what's the hardest conversation that you've had to have around equity? Yeah. So this past summer, um, we, our group of partners also owns Bamboo Earth. So we own a skincare brand called Bamboo Earth. Dave Recook, who many of you know um, on, from the Twitter sphere, uh, is the president of that company, but we, the same group of people own the entity. And so we were going out to New Jersey to have a meeting to talk about bamboo as well as a few other things. And prior to the meeting, I had sent, because there was three of us that owned the majority of the company. Let's say we each had a third of CTC roughly before the ESOP. So minus 20% from that. We all owned about 28% of the company. And my two partners, they were passive. They both work in Bamboo Earth full time. But I had reached a place where if I was going to continue at CTC, I needed to alter those dynamics. Like I just didn't want to continue to offer myself to this thing at this level under that pretense anymore. And so I had wrote an email ahead of the thing saying, Hey, I'd like you to sell me all your shares for a dollar or I'm done. <laughs> um, it was, it was more thoughtful than that, more considerate of a lot of things, but that was the general pretense of it. Um, and I had gone through this, a, a, a so many considerations of doing this. It took a lot. Um, I was in a Hampton group at the time and a group of guys encouraged me and the coach there actually gave me some of the best advice ever. He said, I want you to write this email from three different personas. I want you to write it from Taylor, the friend. I want you to write it as Taylor, the ruthless businessman. And then I want you to write it as Taylor, the peacemaker. And then write because all of those people are inside of you. So I want you to sort of reconcile who you want to be as you head into this conversation. And so it was a really helpful exercise. But it was three days in person of like really hard conversations and sitting and obviously they felt that was really unfair to the work that they had done. And I wanted to both acknowledge my appreciation for everything that they had contributed while also declaring like this is where I'm at with my own um, person. And luckily we were able to work through it. We negotiated to a slightly different number, came up with some terms that were, I sold them back some of my Bamboo Earth shares in different ways. And so we worked through it as a group of people. I think there's probably still feelings that exist on both sides about whether it was fair or right or et cetera. But um, I'm proud of the work that we did to get through it. But it was those were those were uncomfortable, hard conversations. Yeah. What about you, Sean? Well, I don't think I actually like shared our our equity breakdown. So we have yeah. no investors. There's six of us that own 90% of it. And that six is me, Connor, 
uh, Austin, Daniel, and Paul. Those are the three original founders of Ridge. So Daniel and Paul, father, son, they started the thing. Austin's their childhood best friend. And then Marquez Brownlee, famous YouTuber. He's <laughs> he's the other guy. So there's six of us who are 90%. And then 10% is just a, a group of high-level employees. My brother owns one or two percent. Our CFO owns a couple percent. Our COO owns a couple percent. Brett, our VP of product, who... Uh, was the first employee, also childhood best friend. So the the vast majority of our shares are owned by uh, like p- people who more or less who would die for each other, right? So father, son, like that's pretty good. Austin and Daniel literally have been friends since they were six years old, inseparable. And then me and Connor, like taking a bullet for the guy. So uh, yeah, uh, it's it's been pretty fair. <laughs> Nobody put any money into it. And the way the way decisions are made is that like I mean it's we do have a board it's me uh, Marquez and Daniel but like decisions are very much like you know I'm in the driver's seat I'm like hey this is what we need to do as a business and everyone's like all right well let's do it because the other thing is if I could go back in time you know I I I had an agency business uh, Ridge was a client I wish I would have went even more all in on Ridge back then. Right. Like I, I knew that when they were doing five million dollars a year and there's a there's a famous story that Daniel and Austin, who were running the business, they said gun to their head. They would have taken a guaranteed five thousand dollars a day for the rest of their lives if like they could trade the business. And now we have literal hours where I, the smallest hour we'll do today is 20 grand or whatever. Right. So like the, the business is so much bigger than they thought was possible. And there's another famous story where we were sitting like when we decided to merge. You know, Connor, I had to get him in, onto my side to merge the agency in it. And he's like, dude, I just don't think Rich will ever do $100 million a year. He's like, he's like, and if they do, we're not the guys to get him there. Like, we're not smart enough to get that done. And then as soon as we did that, I think we did $100 million in like 2020. I, I called Connor off. I'm like, what's up now, motherfucker? I'm like, what <laughs> guy now? So, uh, yeah, I, I, if I go back in time, I would have went all in. But I mean, difficult conversations. I mean, I this is a family business that was owned by father and son. And I had to be like, hey, you're going to give up 50% and you're going to give it to me and my friend Connor. And that was a hard conversation, right? Um, I, I Luckily, I convinced them uh, and we've been able to like, you know, be pretty equitable the whole time. But yeah. I uh, the, oh, What's coming up for me right now is we, when we did that first round of funding and the venture capital firm that led that they were the ones that raised the the equity amongst founders is imbalanced and that you have to we have to secondary out some shares of this other person right that those conversations with our co-founder were really hard at the time i didn't even want to do it i didn't feel like it was a problem i didn't understand uh and I'm actually just looking now, Sean, I'm, I'm probably like, it's close to like 700 grand that I'm in 750. Yeah. That's what I mean. Like, I just didn't even know. Cause it came like over waves. Um, look the, that conversation. So it's funny is like, I remember feeling not great about the VC asking us to do that. Right. Like this is one of my business partners. And now in hindsight, I think, holy shit, was that person so smart to make us do that? Mm-hmm. Cause like now yeah. when I look at it, I'm like, man, yeah, fully diluted. I would owe not a lot. I would be in this seat, right? If everything was still the same and I did not own a quarter of the company, I probably wouldn't be in the seat right now, right? Like if I'm being brutally honest, I don't right, know Matt, that I would be here. Matt, and you asked Taylor like, uh, like, oh, how come you don't go back and you know put equity into your comp plan? Because hiring an outside CEO, it's not uncommon to give them up to 10% over four or five years, right? Like that is like, I mean, that'd be an aggressive package, but like 5% super fucking common. So, I mean, if you're like, Hey, look, I'm going to do this for another 10 years or 12 years, like Taylor holidays, you are, you are the CTC brand. Like there's no separation at this point. It's like, and I think it's, I think people should have more of those hard conversations. People, people want to like, Everyone wants to think they're in secession, that they're like, oh, we're fucking like, we're wheeling and dealing. At the end of the day, it's like, I'm just not going to do it anymore. What are you going to do about it? And it's like, yeah. oh, the whole thing falls apart. So <laughs> please keep doing the thing you're doing. And how do we incentivize you to get that done? Well, and there's a good point to be made there, Sean, which is I think 
humility and self-awareness and judgment are all kind of bound up together that what you tend to see is people who either really overestimate or really underestimate their importance to the business, which yeah. leads to a discrepancy between their equity uh, stake and what it should be. And that's when you have problems. You have problems when you have a business where, let's say somebody starts it and they've got 80, 90, 100% of the equity, but they just made a couple of all-star hires. And those people are really pulling the business. So yeah, they own all the equity. But if those people left, that equity is all of a sudden worth a fraction of what it's worth. And yet they don't ha proactively get equity to those people because they're creating the value. Or you'll see the inverse, which is we, we've talked about here. Sometimes you know, you've got a key man who it's like, if they leave, the whole thing falls apart and the equity is basically worthless, but they're at 20 or 30% of equity. And that doesn't make sense either. And the thing that makes this difficult, so I was in a business with my brother uh, before before I did Simple Modern. And the way that that business played out, I was I was actually working in full-time ministry when, when I helped him start it. And he gave me 5% equity for helping him start it. And which at the time I thought was really generous. And then as the business grew, I felt like was really not commensurate with my contribution to the business. But the thing that he explained to me at the time, and I've come to appreciate more, is that once the ball is in motion and once these structures are put in place, it's really difficult to change them. And that's what makes it so hard is that you're having to try and like look ahead when you when you set up these equity structures and think through all these circumstances that you could never think about. For example, uh, I've got two co-founders. Uh, great guys. One of them, his family, through a, for a number of reasons, had to move a few years ago. And then his wife and his kids got really sick and it knocked him out of the business. So we were in a situation where fantastic guy, but he can't operate in the business anymore. But he has the third or the, you know, he was basically tied for the second biggest chunk of equity. And he's saying, I actually would love to cash out. So I was in this really difficult situation where it's like, okay, do I go to my the rest of my owners and say, hey guys, let's take all the cash we have and let's get it out to this co-founder who wants to exit the business. In some ways that makes a lot of sense, but in other ways, nobody from the business had really experienced significant distributions at that point. And we would be talking about using all of our liquidity to buy out somebody who wasn't actually in the business anymore, right? So do you do that or do you do the alternative where you've got the second or third, third biggest person on the cap table is not contributing and everybody else is contributing and there's no good answers, right? Like it's, it's, well, th this is, the, yeah. it's a tricky debate though, because is equity something that you cons are, are continuously earning or is it something that you've earned? Well, that's the point I was making is that it, what you would hope is that it's something that you earned. It's not attached to your performance. But like in the case of Taylor, it's easy to say that, but it just isn't true, right? Yes. Like if Taylor the Taylor is so it. important to CDC, you know, it's like it's like saying, you know, like it, it'd be like taking the heart out of a person. It's like the body's not going to be worth much if it doesn't have its heart. And so this is the problem with businesses is that you'd like to kind of really neatly separate and say, this is compensation package. This is based on the work you do. This is equity. This is based on previous contributions, but functionally that doesn't work. No, the psychology of equity doesn't work that way. Like we, right. I think we've been very lucky. I've been lucky in two ways. Like this is something I probably wouldn't change. I think I have really gracious business partners and co-founders in that we can, we've had really hard conversations. And they're both awesome. Like when it like when we get like into shitty conversations, they're both great guys. Like high moral fiber. You know, one of our core values is this idea of like you have to take care of the whole, like the whole thing, not just you. And because of that, I think we've done well with these hard conversations. I also think I got really lucky with investors, guys. Like that some of the stories I hear and some of the shit that VCs pull on founders, we've had not pleasant conversations with our investors. Um, we've had great ones too. Right, like we've stood a whole company up, two companies up, with the money they put in, um, but they've also been like really great because I find I have talked to investors where like they have no idea, like they're just clueless when it comes to psychology of an operator, and like that what what motivates and incentivizes an operator to continue to keep going, right? And I seem to have investors that get it. They're they're two old dogs. They've been around a long time, did a lot of deals, and I think that's probably why. I'm not dealing with kids, um, but holy shit, I could just imagine the pain if I had like, you know, wet behind the ears VC 
telling me what I should do or shouldn't do or how I should feel, you know, like you own enough. And like, I just, I can't imagine how I would probably freak. The, I don't respond well to that. So I'd probably just fucking leave. I, I think this is though, like one of the things that I think founders and if, when I, anytime I coach somebody or spend time with them, I think we as founders do a really poor job of creating clarity for ourselves of how we plan to monetize the, the yeah. asset of the equity <laughs> and the yeah. structure of the kinds of relationships you end up in really matters. Like, so Mike, you're talking about this question of like, do you go buy back this equity from a passive partner? Uh, well, I think the, the question really depends. It's just a capital allocation question relative to when you plan to realize value on that equity and at what price you plan to do it and how it like, but those questions I think in many times are unclear for people. They just think like, oh, I just, I should have equity. So, but you have no clarity of how you actually plan to monetize it. And the structures are so different if you plan to distribute capital as a mechanism for receiving money as shareholders versus if you plan to try and create a transaction. They're just very different games to play. Totally different. And one one point that's worth making, I mean, like there's so many, gosh, there's so many angles we could go here because Taylor, you're bringing up a great point. Certain companies, um, you're just not going to be a good target to be acquired. And so you need to be realistic that, hey, we're going to have to cash flow our way to this equity being worth something. Other ones, that's the entire game. You know, a lot of SaaS companies, it's like, that's the game. You're not ever Dude. going to get it back in cash flow. Yeah. yeah but yeah. I, I, and I, and I think that there's a couple of principles that are worth calling out. Here's the first one. One of the ways that marriage has to work is I went to a marriage conference once and uh, this was maybe in the first or second year of being married. And there was a couple on stage and they basically said, listen, um, here's our story of how we went through her getting diagnosed with cancer. And, and they told this story and how they worked through it. And obviously, that's a very difficult situation. And then they made the point of your marriage is going to have hard things. We just don't know what they are. Maybe it is a cancer diagnosis. Maybe it's a miscarriage. You know, maybe it's a parent that develops Alzheimer's. Maybe it's a, a car wreck. You know, who knows? But something hard is going to happen. And Marriage is a lot about picking a person that with this unknown of what really difficult thing might happen in the future, but knowing that difficult things will happen, that you're like, this is a person I think I could go through that with. And I think that's probably the parallel I would give on equity because you made a great point, Matt. You know, it's like to some extent, because you don't know the hard conversations that'll happen, it's a lot about are you picking people that you feel like are people you could go through hard things with yep. and in and, and a positive and constructive way. Uh, another point that I think is worth bringing up is even people on the equity table are drastically differently positioned. So on mm -hmm. my cap table, I, um, I'm, I'm just under 50%. And that, like I said, that was mostly by choice. Um, but I am more than double the next biggest owner. And I have a lot of minority owners that are between one and 2%. So I am 20, 30 X, you know, 40 X where they're at. So, um, a distribution being material and meaningful to me, uh, you know, like a million dollar distribution is material and meaningful to me. But if you're a 1% owner, it's not really. And one of the things that people need to realize is when you bring on minority owners, you create a situation potentially that looks like this. Somebody has a really significant amount of their net worth in an illiquid asset of equity, and they're very differently situated than you. And you're going to have a level of responsibility and a level of pressure to help them recognize that liquidity or that, that value uh, when it looks really different than you. And that's kind of what I'm going through now. And it's, I guess that's probably in a good problem. It's a good problem to build something that's really valuable where a 1% stake is worth millions of dollars, but it's still an issue that you have to work through. And, and again, this is why this is such a, you know, su such a multifaceted and complex topic. I just want to, I just want to hijack Matt's point earlier about having a gracious group of people around you. You, you know, I feel the most blessed that, you know, uh, Daniel and his dad, they, they owed 90% when I met him. Right. And I, I, I convinced them to give up a huge chunk of it over the past six years or however long it's been. And everyone was smiling and happy and grateful on both sides of that equation. Yeah. And finding people that are willing to appreciate the work being done and understand that like the thing they're building is bigger than the sum of the parts is super fucking rare. So only go into business with people who, who aren't trying to fuck you over. That's my, that's my it's, one. It's, it's hard to figure that out though. Like I think, I mean, I hit the jackpot 
uh, Brad, who's my co-founder, he's also a good friend of mine. Like we mountain bike together. We just, we do life together. Um, he's built so many damn companies at this point, right? And big ones, like big nine figure companies that I think that the, the like time in the oven is what makes him such a good business partner. He's been bankrupt. Like he's written a book about this. So I'm not saying anything that's not public. Um, but I think the one thing I'll say on this subject, Mike, because I think you raise a really good point. There's a double-edged sword of uh, if you're an entrepreneur who has had a win, so like you're financially secure, okay, and you're in business with somebody who is not, Yes, that's a major issue, right? I'm, and like, that is going to be a tension and you have to have a plan for that or it is going to be a real yeah. problem. That's where our, our VC was very smart because he was looking at Brad and I and he was looking at Jeremy, the third partner, and he's like, you and Brad have, are coming off of fresh exits. You've both just sold companies. Jeremy, this is his first business. This is like at some point that's going to become a problem, right? Like there's going to be a, holy shit, this thing is worth how much? And I have how much on paper? And he's never experienced that. So I think that was really smart of our VC. I'll give, I'll give you a very real example of this, Matt. So when Kayla, when we started Kayla, so Silicon Running Rings, my brother, me, his business partner, okay? His business partner, Ted, myself, and there was a small group, other group of people. We had an offer in 2018 to sell the company for $50 million to a group called SF Equity, okay? We're in the final stages of deal closure. And the tension all the time was the one business partner who was, had done better off in his life previously, thought it was a billion dollar company someday. Right. And, and so 50 felt like failure, where to the rest of us, it felt like an absolute home run smash. Um, yeah. And the deal fell apart in the final days over his employment contract, couldn't get it done and across the line. The company ends up selling for a quarter of that three years later. And right. it was... It, the, the tension in that moment, it felt like I was talking to an alien from a different universe. Like we just could not reconcile the Delta and what we both needed or wanted out of life. And it was like, it was just irreconcilable in the perspective that both had about what they wanted out of the future. Yeah, man, you nailed it, Taylor, because it takes a certain level of irrationality to, to be an entrepreneur. You have to like, I've said this before, it's like, you have to be like borderline optimistic on borderline naive in order to actually start a company. You have to believe that you can disrupt the way the world works. But then sometimes that really is the thing that drives people into bankruptcy or drives people to really overestimate an asset that they have and how big it can be and what it's really worth, right? Yeah. I mean, do you guys want to, I, I want to, this is such a great conversation. I'm happy we had this. Um, <laughs> I, I just think I'm thinking of like we gotta we gotta wrap here. Sean, how, how do we, we gotta go. how do we bridge to the well, uh, the, the Mike, data conversation? Mike's talking about how the way the world works, so I think we should I think yeah, we yeah. should get into that next and let Taylor do his thing. Because um, I think a lot of this, I mean, Mike, what you're hitting on, Taylor, what you're hitting on, a lot of this has to do with timing and luck. Um, yeah, totally. That's right. A, that's a good and story. and just like trying to read the damn waves of of what we're up to. So I think that's. That's where we go next. Sean, what do you want to, what do you want to finish on, man, for today? Well, this is going to be part one. Uh, part two, we're actually going to do what we're supposed to do and talk about the data behind <laughs> Q2 <laughs> and the first half of the year. So this has been a great therapy session. Everyone, everyone dived into their company structure, equity, everything else. But Taylor actually came here because he has a uh, really important, impactful data about the size of the e-commerce industry in the first half of 2024. So Taylor, I don't know if you just want to maybe paint like a one minute picture of it, and then we can actually get into the data and we'll go from there. Yeah, great. So we're excited. This is an aggregate view of the D2C or e-commerce space. These terms get used interchangeably, I think at this point, of the first half of 2024 in comparison to first half of 2023. Uh, and to leave you with a little teaser, what we're going to be looking with is a same store sample set of a little over 600 stores in terms of how they grew on raw dollars on a percentage basis. We're going to break it down by seven figure stores, eight figure stores. We're going to look at the home goods space. We're going to look at the fashion accessories space specifically for these guys uh, and try and make sense of the macro environment and context in which we all exist. Okay. Super so Taylor, cool. I'm going to hit you with some quick questions before we dump in, jump into the data. Uh, on uh, the state of e com we'll do one word answers. Okay. Uh, in general, the average e com brand is blank. Up single digit percentages. That's not one word, but 
slightly. The uh. most challenging thing about today's environment is the lack of available capital. Hmm. Would you start an e-commerce business today? Not without a massive, unique leverage point. What single thing is true of companies that are having the most success growing? Access to organic audience. What sales channel or marketing channel has jumped out at you the most recently? Meta. There we go. All right. So that's the preview, everybody. And we will get into the numbers Love it. next time. Taylor, thanks, man. That was a great conversation. Thanks, guys. All right, y'all. Yeah. Great Talk hanging, soon. guys. Okay. That's a wrap. Stay tuned for part two. That was super fun to have Taylor on. Uh, I can't wait to, to listen to the, some of the nuanced data on what's going on in the market. Um, also kind of surprised by today's topic. We kind of came into this not knowing that we were going to talk cap tables and ownership and equity and psychology of ownership and psychology of you know partners and difficult conversations and all that good stuff. So I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you got some value out of it. Let's see you on part two.